Hi everyone, good evening. I'm Carol Cavanaugh, I'm the acting superintendent, and tonight we have this forum because um, in the wake of what happened in uh, Florida on February 14th, we decided as a community it was time to come together and sort of you know, assuage some of our fears, talk about some of the things that we have done, talk about some of the things that we can do. And we brought this panel of people together who are very thoughtful, very involved in our community, and those people who are primarily responsible for public and school safety. So I am going to allow them to introduce themselves. Um, this evening we will each probably take a little bit of time to share out some thoughts and ideas with you, and then we will open it up to you so that you can have time for question and answers. After all, that's what a forum is about, and we really want to hear your voices as well. So. Hello, I'm Vanessa Bellello. I'm the principal of the Hopkins School. Good evening, Alan Keller, principal of the middle school. Joe Bennett, Hopkinson PD. Steve Slamman, Fire Chief Emergency Management Director. Denise Hildreth, Director of Youth and Family Services. Before I pass the mic, I just want to recognize Amanda Fargiano, who is not up here, but did, was sort of the impetus behind us thinking that this was a good idea, so I just wanted to recognize that. I'm Evan Bishop, the principal here at the high school. Welcome. Ed Lee, Chief of Police. John Porter, Operations Lieutenant. Ashok Coach, the uh, Director of Technology. Thanks for coming. Lauren Duveau, the principal of the Center School. Phil Powers, the SRO. And we may have an additional principal arriving. She's a little bit stuck on 495 right now, so that will be Ann Carver, the principal at the Elmwood School. Um, I think we'll start by asking Ashok to talk a little bit about the changes that we've made in security and technology over the past five years, because he has been largely responsible for that work. And then we'll talk to some of our other panelists. It'd be embarrassing if I couldn't get the technology to work, so let's, uh, let's try that one more time. Uh, thanks for being here tonight and taking the time uh, to join us. Uh, I think my responsibility is obviously to take you back over the last several years to talk about some of the work that the uh, district has done uh, with the community uh, and the administrative staff and teachers to kind of come together to take a look at our uh, security measures and to look at ways to make uh, improvements uh, to the district to keep our, our students safe. Uh, here in Hopkinton. Uh, so really looking back several years ago, um, a lot of this work, even though it's been ongoing for a long time, really got uh, focused um, right around the summer of 2014, uh, post Sandy Hook. Uh, we were looking uh, at ways of making improvements in the district. Uh, so the town decided to work with the schools uh, to run a safety audit of all of the uh, town and school buildings. Uh, that audit was uh, run in the summer of 2014 uh, by a company called BCM Controls. Uh, and they looked, took a look at all of our facilities and, and kind of established a, a report, an audit report for us to take a look at to drive strategic planning for the district uh, that year. So I'm just going to share and read with you some of the findings uh, from that audit, which drove a lot of the changes over the last several years. Uh, so one of the key findings was that many of the facilities in the district and within the town uh, primarily had older equipment that didn't necessarily communicate with each other, uh, weren't really connected back to anything beyond basic alarm systems uh, that were monitored at night, your typical uh, burglar alarm systems, without really having activity or alarms on during the day. Um, there was no system-wide access control systems uh, to monitor doors. Most buildings had traditional master lock setups there were no common security databases to establish accounts for key fobs or security keys, the exception being the police department, which had 24-hour monitoring at the time. Uh, the schools had recently added some A phones uh, to each of the buildings. These are the phones you'll see when you enter any of the buildings where uh, you buzz somebody and they can see you on camera. Those were in place at time, so we were looking at ways to incorporate the existing equipment with some of the newer equipment. Um, there were very few cameras uh, that existed in town or in school buildings. Uh, that were available to promote public safety or to help support investigations. And there were no network-based monitoring system to support a command center uh, style operation or model. Um, in addition, there was no visitor management system in place for schools, although there was traditional sign-in systems uh, and verification of IDs and things of that nature. There was no shared database, for example, 
uh, that do exist these days. Uh, for example, there's a, there's a sex offender database and some other databases that you can subscribe to. So none of those visitor type management systems were in place at any of the buildings. Um, beyond that, uh, we looked also um, at other non-technical um, recommendations. For example, the use of barriers, crime prevention through environmental design, and there are some other recommendations about the development and deployment of certain signage just to kind of uh, prevent uh, particular petty crimes and things of that nature. So that was some other things that the audit uh, highlighted. So we took a look at these findings. Um, you know, just as a, an overview, uh, the district has a, a district level safety task force that meets on a regular basis. Uh, that, that group consists of the superintendent, all key administrators, and then key uh, staff uh, from the public safety departments, including fire uh, and the police station. So we meet on a regular basis to kind of go over uh, the plan, the safety plan that the district has to make sure that things are being imp implemented. So one of the first tasks of that group was to take a look at these findings and, and make some recommendations uh, for the town and for the schools. And we decided to take some efforts uh, to make changes. And so after the audit, some of the changes we made to the local securities were as follows. Um, we started to develop and maintain a common user database uh, for security for both town and, and school employees uh, and moved away from the traditional lock and key systems to an electronic digital key fob system, which is centrally managed and organized. Uh, and so, for example, if someone um, leaves the district or is fired for some reason, we can immediately disable that key fob without having a lot of extra work to go and rekey all of the doors uh, in a building. So beyond cost savings, it's, it's a much easier system to manage and it's a much more secure system. Uh, in addition to that, we put access controllers, um, which work with these key fobs at all of the buildings uh, throughout the district, uh, including the central admin building, uh, to allow uh, staff and key personnel to enter uh, buildings that they had permission to be in. Uh, over the last several years, we started, uh, once the uh, access controllers or key fobs were distributed and staff were trained on that, we started to implement perimeter cameras on those key doors where these access controllers were, so we'd have some insight into people entering and leaving the building uh, in those key areas. Um, beyond that, we started to uh, create double entry points at all of the school buildings. Uh, those air gap spaces where you'll see out here on the left in the high school, uh, where you have to be buzzed into a place and then buzzed in again uh, to create an extra level of safety and security between outside and inside uh, of the facilities. Uh, beyond that, we upgraded over the last two years all of the alarm systems in the four buildings, which is the middle school, high school, obviously, center is coming with a new building, Marathon School, and then Elmwood. All have new uh, alarm intrusion detection systems that are now in place and operational which gives uh, the building security not only at night when we're away from the building, but during the day when the building is occupied. So we now have eyes and ears kind of on all the doors uh, in the main buildings on campus. Uh, and in the next uh, several weeks, the month, we'll also have notifications that are triggered on key door events. So if a student perhaps leaves a door open or propped, uh, key personnel will get an email notifying uh, that building and, and the resource officer, that, do that door is left ajar and we can go and, and deal with that. So before the, those systems were put in place, we didn't really have that level uh, of kind of access uh, over the perimeter doors besides physically going and checking all of them. So it makes it a much more efficient system. Uh, in addition to the um, alarm systems being updated, we, over the course of several years, have placed panic buttons and all of the buildings uh, access, that have access to, you know, the key personnel have access to in case of emergencies that are connected to emergency response. Uh, we have blue lights in place in large spaces, uh, like the music room, where if there's an emergency announcement being made and there's an extra amount of noise in those areas, those teachers, as an example, there's one up on the left there, uh, those will blink uh, if there's an emergency announcement, which will also help trigger the teacher to take action if needed. Um, We've done some additional upgrades to our communication system. So one of the big updates was moving uh, our walkie-talkies for our admin team to a digital platform, which is more secure uh, and has better communication among uh, the CRT teams in each building. But we also established a district-wide principals channels, 
So principals can communicate uh, across buildings on the secure radio channels, which also have access to the police and fire on that same radio. So it really brings the school and the, the uh, town public safety officials together on one platform in a secure manner. And that's really improved uh, communications uh, for both the town and the schools. Over the last two years, we've adopted a new mobile security app called Crisis Go, which is a redundant communication system. So if for some reason we have radio failure or there's uh, phone failure in the building, we have a mobile app that can work on cellular signals or via Wi-Fi. It also allows administrators and key personnel to communicate uh, in a crisis event. It also allows us to alert teachers in an event. Uh, and there's also a number of key personnel contact information there and some other features within, within the app uh, that help teachers uh, and admin make decisions in the, in the event of a, of a drill or, or a crisis. And then finally, um, over the last couple of years, we've also added internal cameras. Uh, primarily starting here at the high school, we've added 16 internal cameras. Um, and then there will be some future plans to add additional uh, equipment in the years to come. And then finally, I know there's other people here that are willing to talk, and, and, and so I'll, I'll, I'll shut, shut the mic off in a second. Uh, you know, beyond having training and, 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 sorry, beyond having all the technology and equipment and the upgrades, Another huge factor is working together and training not only our administrative team, but uh, all of the staff. So they know how to use these tools and they know how to respond in an emergency. So a lot of time has been spent also on training staff. Uh, we've uh, conducted uh, ICT or incident command training in collaboration with the town so that if the, the police or fire set up an incident command center, we all have designated roles at each building so that we can communicate on a similar platform. We've developed ALICE protocols, which I'm sure the principals or Phil can, can talk about. Um, over the last two years, those protocols have now been implemented at all of the schools. Um, I've talked a little bit about the monthly CRT meetings, which are building-based safety meetings that happen on a regular basis. They also happen after an event to debrief and to reflect and to make changes to procedures and policies. Um, and then beyond that, we do regular table chop drills in, in coordination with the town. Um, every building goes through those drills. These are additional drills beyond the normal fire drills that we do in the district that really help hone our skills and really help practice uh, what I've been preaching over the last few minutes. So those are really important and we'll continue to do those uh, moving forward. Um, beyond that, like I said, there's future um, improvements to be made. There'll be additional cameras uh, that will be going in the buildings over the next two years. Uh, there'll be additional cameras taking a look at the Lupro and some of the uh, fields and properties. Uh, beyond that, we'll look at um, having some visitor <coughs> management systems put in place to help control uh, some of the visitors that are coming into the buildings. Um, and beyond that, really looking at continued training and, and collaboration between the community and the town to make sure our procedures are always reflecting current events. So I will kind of pass it on and see if, if we want to take questions about that at this point, or if we want other people to kind of chime in. Chief, do you want to kind of update for next? Sure. It's amazing, I've only been here four years, but that type of work that's been done, it's just been such a wonderful collaborative effort, and it really shows how much these people up here on the stage, and the whole staff at the school, police department, fire department, town officials, <laughs> care about your kids. And that's certainly a priority for the Hopkinton Police Department. And we spend a lot of time on training, and uh, uh, we, we do active training We're here in the schools. We have uh, several uh, in service trainings on the latest way to go into a school and direct the threat if there was an active shooter. We all know after Columbine that, <clears throat> you know, the game had changed. No more waiting for SWAT teams, no more gearing up outside and then make a move in together. You get to a school, the priority is to get to that shooter and take him out. And I think that's drilled into the head of every one of my offices. Uh, I know we saw something different happen down in Florida. I don't really know what to say about that issue, but I'm pretty confident in the men and women of the Hopkins uh, Police Department that wouldn't happen here. One of the biggest things, we talk about all the technology and the security mes uh, measures, but the biggest thing and what we saw happen down in Florida is prevention. There was, what, 36 red flags down there. If I had one red flag go unnoticed, you know, I would consider myself a failure at my job. We worked together as a great group, 
and uh, the incident crisis teams. Anytime we get information of any possible threat to our children at this school, we are on top of it, we vet it thoroughly, we take action when we have to. So I'm just uh, very proud to be a chief of the Hawkins Police Department, work with all the great men and women, and very proud to be part of this uh, collaborative effort to make sure that the children in the Hopkins school system are under the uh, safest plan it could possibly be. They said a lot of effective preparedness that makes me proud. We've done a lot of work with the schools. Uh, we work together with the police, which really a, a one unit for public safety. Um, technology is a big deal. Technology, from my perspective, came in slow, and then it came like a wave in the last five years for Hopkinton. And I just can't tell you, with our organizations being small, just the amount of um, ability, situational awareness that it brings to us. Um, and I just, you know, Ashokan's team, working with our uh, IT group in the town, it's been amazing. Um, I won't tell you all the little secrets, but it it's goes far beyond even what Ashok talks about. Um, just some of our work and preparedness when we started to combine our dispatch, be able to work off of a common uh, platform of communications. Um, and it continues some of the um, new technology they've done with their radios, um, the, the systems they've put into the buildings, and our ability to come up and just immediately integrate in um, with our cell phones and some of the other tools. Just um, we have immediate awareness, and that's, that's a big deal when uh, we're transitioning from preparedness to responding and then afterwards in recovery. So um, I'm really proud of the schools. Preparedness is about uh, taking it on on your own, be, being prepared taking your responsibility for it. And, um, you know, Ashuk just demonstrated how much effort the schools have put into being prepared. We enjoy, um, the last couple of years, we've been down doing tabletop exercises with all the principals and staff, and it's amazing um, how much the success and understanding of our policies. Uh, they've rewritten all of their school policies in the last two years, and, and when you rewrite them, you um, reintroduce it to every single person here, and um, everybody on the stage has been involved, and again, another level of preparedness. Um, I love the focus on preparedness. Um, we are ready for the response. We're confident in our response, but it's so nice to get the preparedness and all the effort on the preparedness before that. So, um, as Emergency Management Director and Fire Chief, I just want to say to you that I have a lot of confidence in our system and the people that are working on it. So, thank you. Hi, everybody. So, I'm your community social worker along with Colleen Souza, who's in the audience. And, um, you know, I wanted to make sure that I had something clear to say that wasn't going to be redundant of what everybody else has to say. And so, I've been a resident of Hopkinton most of my life, raised my kids here. And you know, I see some people in the audience who also grew up with me. Um, and one of the reasons that it was so important for me to work here is because this is an incredibly supportive, um, dialed-in community where parents are really in tune with what's happening with kids, where all the professionals on this stage are so committed to the work, where Colleen and I, you know, as partners, I think we really see our job as reducing any sense of isolation or being alone in the work of raising kids or being part of a community or pro providing for the needs that people have. So in addition to the people that are up here, I see all of you in the audience, some of you hold important positions in the town, some of you are you know, just sort of average residents who reach out to neighbors, and reach out to people and are dialed in with kids who need things. We have an incredible faith community. So I think we really see our job as um, reducing isolation. Colleen and I talk a lot about uh, making sure that people don't feel alone. And some of the families that we work with have a ton of support. They have families and friends and community and teachers, and others really don't have anybody. And so we really want to be those people who can kind of say, you'll never be alone as long as we're here. And I think this community speaks to that in lots of different ways. Um, because what we know about shootings and horrible tragic events that have taken place, before even mental illness has been talked about, before guns were talked about, 
there's usually a backstory that has to do with isolation and feeling alone, feeling like you didn't fit in, or feeling like you weren't important to the community. And I think this is a place where we really do a lot of work to reduce those things from happening, where you know I call on everybody up here and lots of other people all the time, and we go in together, and people are not afraid to say, hey, you know, Phil will call me and say, I'm concerned about this person. I'm not sure that they have anybody. Can I count on you to reach out to them? Um, and sometimes, it's not even a demographic that we're meant to serve. So we're meant to serve children and families. So sometimes there's a gap with people that are middle-aged and don't have kids. But if they call us, we're not gonna say, you know, sorry, that's, that's not what we do. We're gonna respond, and, and sometimes that's, that's an urgent response. I've been on ambulance calls with some of the people here for people that don't really fit into my demographic, but I think that really speaks to the commitment that nobody in this community should feel alone or that they don't count. Like, we want people to feel like not only do you matter here, but we can't do the work of community without you. So I guess that's sort of the, the even before we triage mental health or triage risk or triage and, and kind of get ready for episodes to happen, there's a lot of background work that takes place, and I think all of us are responsible for that. So I guess that's a message that I want to send, and I'm happy to take questions when the time comes. So I think that our panel has delivered the information that um, we had talked about before um, the evening. And so at this point, what we'd like to do is just have people come up to the microphone. I'll, I'll come down to you, and then you can pose questions to anyone up here on the stage. to training, um, I know what your teachers go through as far as lockdown trainings and so on, but what about the pool of substitutes that you have? How does that fit into the training and when they come into sub for a class? Do they go through the same trainings that the, the teachers do? Do they, is it similar to a fire drill? How are they prepped in order to be in the classroom to know about what the communications are that need to happen and if there is a lockdown or shelter in place situation? Um, hi, for those of you who came in late, I'm Vanessa Bilal, I'm the principal at the Hopkins School. Um, all of us principals are involved in the hiring process for substitutes. Obviously, they're not in a building on a regular basis, and many of them are in all five buildings. So one of the things we communicate to our staff members on a regular basis is that there is an expectation that you are going to help out in those situations. We certainly give our red folders, our emergency folders, the procedures are posted in the building, but when you have a substitute who may be in my building one day and Alan's the next, it's um, not reasonable to expect them to know those procedures very well. Um, a little over a year ago, we had a fire at Hopkins School, which resulted in a, a real emergency and an evacuation, and I can tell you, both of our PE teachers happened to be out that day. So for a good example, in that situation, there was a paraprofessional in there, and I also had a secretary who went in and joined the two substitutes that were in there to make sure that our evacuation procedures were followed. And so in our building, we have switched teachers. There's an expectation, there's a conversation that occurs during our safety meetings. We had a faculty meeting just yesterday, reviewing our procedures again. And these are the kinds of conversations we have. So when you have a staff of upwards of 60 in my building, much higher in Allen and Evans building, we have an expectation that our staff that are there on a regular basis and are trained in our specific procedures are going to pull in those other staff that come in on an intermittent basis. Switch sure, switch teacher meaning the classrooms that share a, a doorway or a pod in our building. Um, so that's how we handle those substitutes because we just, you can go through procedures. We've talked as a principal's team and with fire and safety about the idea of having going through, giving them pamphlets every single day. But I just think in reality, unless you're living this and going through all of those drills that we do on a regular basis with our staff, it's not fair when you're gonna be in one building then one day and then to know, you're just not familiar with the evacuation procedures even. So it's much more important to train our regular staff on, our, on how to pull those people in.
from a surrounding teacher. Hi, if I may just make a couple of comments in regards to the incident that happened February 1st at the, at the high school. Um, I have a junior, and my understanding is the kids had an option. You can take the bus, you can get picked up, or you can drive home. So for those students who were parked down in J and K, my understanding is there wasn't any kind of police presence down there. They just went down and walked. And, you know, maybe it was, didn't feel as much of a threat because, you know, it was a single round of hunting. It was an abundance of caution, which thank you. I do appreciate how you responded to it. But if someone is going to come in and be menacing in a high school or school, you know better than I, but my guess is the profile, it's either a current student or a former student who's going to know that you're gonna have 60 kids or so streaming down to their lots down in you know, J and K and, and wherever. Um, so I would ask that maybe you consider something like that. The second piece to that is my son came home and he's like, mom, you know, I didn't think it was a big deal. I knew that, you know, all right, this is a misunderstanding, but it took me so long. It was such a traffic jam that if this really were a bad situation, we're sitting ducks. So the good news is we're an enclosed campus, but the bad news is it's an enclosed campus that there's no real evacuation route, that if these kids, people, staff, staff from Hopkins need to get out quickly, you know, barring, you know, driving down center trail, you know, maybe, I don't know, I don't know what the answer is to that, but I ask that you consider something in the future. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I can comment on your, your second question, and maybe Chief Lee can comment on the first. Sure. So part of our ALICE protocol, um, in a situation, for example, where we have students evacuate the building, uh, oftentimes we're not going to encourage them to get in their cars and leave the building. We're going to have them just kind of get out of the building. And there are relocation spots around the area that kids would know about where we would kind of reunificate and meet there and have either kids leave from there, parents pick them up from there, even the buses come to there. So this situation was a little bit different. We, had a, we felt that there wasn't an immediate threat, we just wanted to get kids off the campus, and so that's why we let them get in their cars and drive off, but if it was a different type of situation where we need to get everybody off campus, we would say, do not get to your cars, go to the reunification locations, there's two of them, we don't usually make that public, we, the kids will know about it, but we don't want anybody else to kind of know about it in the midst of a, of a crisis. So um, that's where they would go, and then we would do some reunification, contact parents and get kids home from there. So there wouldn't be as much of a traffic jam like there was this past time. We live in a small town, uh, on a certain day, uh, school day, we have about four offices, county command staff, all, all resources were brought to the school and then we have to look out for other agencies to assist us, but the state police were able to do so. Um, it may not look like there is a, a presence in the back lot, but what we do in a situation like that, is we put like a, a hasty car out there, a detective uh, was in an unmarked car, uh, traveling with uh, SWAT gear and uh, totally geared up to handle the situation. It, it, it wasn't a, a situation where we thought it was an immediate threat, but we still took the precautions to make sure that while the uh, children were leaving, we had uh, uh, adequate coverage and uh, in all areas of the uh, school. This also was an evacu it wasn't an evacuation, it was a dismissal. Okay. So um, we could do the dismissal the way that we did it. All right. But if it was any type of evacuation, it would have been done completely different. Good evening. I moved into town about two years ago, so I wasn't intimately familiar with the procedures here, and I, I am in great respect for everything you've done and for the clear <coughs> commitment to our children. Thank you for that. My question relates to, I think it's wonderful in this community that we open our schools for so many different organizations to enjoy them. Men's teams playing basketball at night, this forum, uh, my daughter is across at the junior high at a concert. But what I do know is that I came into a totally unlocked door and I have full access to the school. And so does anybody. Whether they belonged at this event or whether they belonged at the concert or whether they belonged at the men's league. In the previous community I was in, we had lock gates that after a certain time of evening when the children had been cleared out of the building, the building was open for the public to use for, for sponsored events, but you couldn't access the whole building. 
The concern is whether you could have someone with malintent enter the building during one of these wonderful <laughs> events and do whatever. I don't even want to think about what they could do, but things could be placed where they shouldn't be placed. They could stay there and scare the children the next morning. I'd just like to know if there's a thought process for limiting not the public access to known events, but limiting off the school access during that time. So at Marathon, we have that impact plan, the new building that we'll be moving into next year for pre-K, K and one. There is a gate that will close off um, the K-1 wing and doors that will lock for preschool. So community use, we want you to use the building, the gymnasium, gymnasium, perhaps the cafetorium, and it will limit access. People will not have the ability to um, be in other parts of the building. So in terms of building marathon, there are different features that we're not able to support at center. We're the only school without that double entry. Next year, we will have that double entry. Right now, families have to leave items in a deck box. And I know it's not welcoming, but we're working on limiting the access to the school. Next year, we have a double entry. And upon that, you have to go through the office. You will not then even access the school. So in terms of planning, we met with police and fire um, and technology designing that building as best we could to be welcoming for children, but also have some of these other systems in place, thinking on how best we can protect while we carry out our educational programming. Yeah, and thank you, because I think you do make a good point. I've worked in other districts where the academic wings at night are, are sealed off, so that if we are having an event in a major space like the gym, the auditorium, families can get there, but they can't get into the academic wings. It makes sense. From the high school, you talk about design with Marathon. The high school is just not designed in that way. I think if you think about it, the gymnasium is where many of these events are probably happening after school. And there's a, an entryway down by the gym, that, but there's no real parking down there where people would come through that door. I think it was initially set up that way that a lot of the traffic would come in just by the cafeteria and be able to kind of keep people in that area. But there's no real parking. The parking is out here, so you have to kind of walk through the school. We do shut off the academic hallways. But you're right, you can come right in here in this main area and then walk down the stairs to the gym. So it is a kind of a, 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 an area that is just this hallway here and then down to the, to the gym. Um, but it's not set up like Dr. Kavanaugh mentioned in, in our other school district. So it's something that we can consider, especially maybe having that back entrance be a little bit more of that's the way you come into the gymnasium for events. That's a good, that's a very good point. And I would just add, I, mean, I think it's a question that we have to, that we have, to have. I mean, you know, at the middle school we have uh, two gyms, so we have the, Doyle Gym, where a lot of events happen, and so it's it's there's, it's impossible to get to the Doyle Gym without walking through uh, the entire school. So there's definitely a, a conversation that needs to be had to say, are we going to uh, limit access and, and not allow community use uh, beyond a certain time? And I, you know, it's it's been wonderful to have it open, but um, yeah, it's, it's it's certainly a question that's there. We've made adjustments at Hopkins School as well. Um, we don't have as many events as the other buildings, but we do have things like Metro Basketball. And over the last um, three years, there's been a lot of changes as part of this audit. Um, at the elementary level, for example, we have um, after-school programs that run past 3.30, which is when the office is closed. Prior to th two years ago, the, um, the building was unlocked at that time, and that's no longer the case. The building is completely locked up when the office, all the time. And so when the office is closed, they have to go use other doors which do lock off. So for example, the, the sports teams that use our gym, they go in through one entrance that is a, con a controlled entrance into the gym and does not allow access to the rest of the building. So those were changes that were part of the audit in the time that I've been in Hopkinton to um, further secure it. But it, it is a challenge and then we hear a lot from families who are frustrated who have pickups at 3.45 or 4. I can't go in and see my kid. No, you can't because the building's closed. We can't sign you in. You're going to need to wait outside. And I would say but, um, for the most part, it's been a very um, understanding response from the community that yes, it's a little more of a hassle for you to wait at your car and have the students brought out, but this is all about us making the building more secure and not having people walking through the buildings when we're not signing in and checking who that is and there's no one working in the office. And at Elmwood School, we do have the capacity to close off ac academic wings and we do. So um, we do have after school programs that are in the gymnasium 
And we actually have a, a door with a fob within the school. So the fob is the things that the, the keyless entry that people use to get in. And, and we have a, a keyless entry point within the school itself so that we can close off the school at, depending on the need at different times. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank First of all, I'd like to thank the uh, panel for coming forward this evening to um, alleviate some of our fears and educate all of us. And I want to thank everybody for coming. One of the things we have to remember is that this is a small group of us here um, listening tonight. And when we're going back to the bus stops, back to our neighborhoods, we should, keep, we should continue to pass on this information because some other people may be anxious and worried about their kids and they couldn't make it out this evening. So again, thank you. But my question is, in, in the last few years, we've um, invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in um, cameras and technology. And they also had that down in Florida. But one of the issues was that they had a 20 minute delay on their cameras and they weren't able to access them tactically. Do we have that capability? And if not, uh, we should put it in the budget. Well, we, we have the capacity, and I'll just speak this on the school side. Of the <clears throat> we have the capacity to, to, to view the all the camera feeds live without a delay. And we have the capacity to do it in house and mobile. So that, that is in place now. Do all police officers have access to the app yet that allows that to happen? No, we don't. But the access is there, but we're, we're growing that section of the, the technology. Thank you. question that goes beyond school safety. I'm on the board for Hockington Little League, so we're wondering if there's things that we should be doing and other of the sports leagues in town where we obviously have a lot of children gathered in open spaces, or are there things, conversations that we should be having at that level to protect our children? You bring up a good point. Uh, I think we remember back it was two years ago when we had the uh, person in the gray vehicle driving around uh, through several towns. Um, yeah, it, it's a wide open area, a lot of kids around, a lot of confusion, a lot of things going on. That's what you, you really have to rely on the parents and other kids around to be as vigilant as possible. Always be aware of their surroundings. Uh, you'll see something, say something, someone looks out of place. Call the police. Someone that uh, I know might seem like harassment or something, but in the long run, you know, better, better safe than sorry. Uh, we try to uh, patrol as many of those events as we can, calls permitting and, and time permitting. I encourage my uh, officers uh, to you know, spend a little time at the events. When they look like uh, they're uh, not doing their job and or standing around watching the game, but it serves a, a, a purpose. It actually, shows two purposes one for safety and one for uh, community engagement. So the biggest thing you can uh, uh, take from that, and you bring up a great point, is uh, constant vigilance and being aware of your surroundings <coughs> and, and pass it along to your kids. Pardon my naivete, um, but as a person who's never fired a gun, I'm quite unfamiliar with the gun laws. Um, how so, parts of this question, but uh, is there an age restriction for owning a gun? And you mentioned uh, red flags. What could be done if you notice that there is someone who's threatening? What can you do? Well, obviously, there's been many uh, avenues that we, get, we, we can take. Dealing with whether it's a mental health issue or not, or someone possibly receiving information that someone's in possession of a gun that doesn't, uh, it shouldn't be, or is not licensed to. There's many investigative techniques. There's search warrants. There's uh, home visits. There's getting gathering information on the co a computer, uh, like any other uh, criminal investigation. And uh, I'm going to pass this over to uh, Lieutenant Bennett because he's worked hard all night to do a little present on LTC, but he's going to get into the uh, uh, the nuts and bolts of the uh, gun laws. So fortunately in Massachusetts, we have extremely stringent gun laws. 
and the, anything that wasn't addressed legislatively has been addressed by the Attorney General through her actions and, and through her power of her office. So the, the question about age is uh, the ability to purchase guns begins at 18 after a licensing process. So there's an FID licensing process where the person applies to this police station at 18 years old. They go through an extensive background and there's a whole list of things that automatically disqualify them. Uh, prior convictions of even misdemeanors, including simple uh, driving under the influence, uh, mental health issues, substance abuse issues, uh, domestic violence issues, restraining orders. Uh, there's a big background check that goes through automatically, including the search of um, state mental health records. If the person passes all that, they still have to pass our level of suitability. And suitability, through that search, we search out police records that might not have resulted in arrest, any uh, in-home type of calls, and we use that, and we have the ability to deny a person with an FID card even, uh, based on suitability. And that's an option that wasn't available years ago. FID cards were issued for $2 for life if you um, didn't have any, any convictions. There was no discretion of the chief. And legislatively, that's been shored up. And now the chief, or, or me through the chief's authority, has the ability to deny based on suitability for an FID card. Now an FID card allows you to have a long rifle or shotgun with low capacity. So five rounds for a shotgun or 10 rounds for a rifle. No detachable mags, no AR-15s, none of the, the, the very hot topic firearms that people carry, and uh, no handguns. When the person becomes 21 years old, they can apply for a license to carry, and that would allow them to carry handguns and high capacity rifles and shotguns. And again, that's all based, they, they maintain that based on suitability. So every night, databases are scoured, and if something, if someone were to pop up on a court record, or, or mental health commitment, or an issue like that, a suitability inquiry would come into our office, and then we would review it and, and suspend the license or, or deal with it immediately. We, we do this, unfortunately, somewhat regularly, and uh, we're on top of it. We take the suitability aspect of it very seriously, and we suspend it and revoke and we're not, I'm not afraid, we're not afraid to go to court and revoke someone's FID or permit. Uh, on the issue of a lot of the guns that are in the news, they're gone. Nobody here can walk in and, and go buy a brand new AR at, at Dick's Sporting Goods. So uh, again, the Attorney General has, has intervened and those guns are, are, are no longer available for sale. I'm not saying they, they're not out there. They, the, the ones that were out there are still out there, but the sale through dealers of those firearms has been so. so I kind of wanted to get a summary of it and anything to do with gun law, I'd be happy to continue. Thank you. I was just wondering what preventive measures are in place um, from someone actually bringing a weapon to school. Like when the kids are coming to school, when there's a play or something going on, are there any metal detectors, x-ray machines? And if not, is that something that would be viable to do? Well, just to answer shortly, there are no metal detectors or x-ray machines on any of the buildings on campus. So when the doors are unlocked, when the kids come to the school, someone can bring a weapon in. I will also say that um, just recently, Again, in the wake of Florida, the Massachusetts School Superintendent Association put out an email chain asking if there are schools in Massachusetts that do in fact have metal detectors. Of the respondents, so I can't say that every single school in Massachusetts, but there were many, many superintendents who did respond, and of the respondents, two of them did say that they have officers in their building who do in fact carry wands, but none of them had metal detectors at their front doors. Um, in speaking with Chief Lee this morning, you know, we did have a conversation about the kinds of things that our kids bring into schools every day. They come in with laptops, cell phones, metal coffee cups. It would take an inordinate amount of time for us to get all of those kids through the door, and I'm not saying that, you know, at some point in time there may be that kind of technology. 
Uh, but, you know, at this point in time, it's hard to imagine getting all of our kids in. And Chief Lee did say to me, so when you have that kid at your door and you realize that he has a weapon in his hand, it may, at that point, sort of be too late, right? I think some of the things that Denise was talking about, and I know that someone also asked us a question about the kinds of screening. And we talk about screening for handguns, but we do a lot of screening in our schools for depression, suicide, opioid use, and in very extreme cases, we also conduct risk assessments on our kids. So there will be students that we will say, until a risk assessment is performed and the district pays for it, we don't allow that student back into our buildings if we are that concerned that that person could be bringing danger into the building. Um, I appreciate that we have to get buzzed into the schools, and I think most of the parents have kind of gotten over the awkwardness of you know, shutting the door behind another parent and waiting until they come in. Um, but I wonder if the students at the middle school and the high school are given any instructions about not letting people into the building at the front door, but also at the back doors and the side doors. Yeah, I can comment from the high school's perspective. Yeah, we, 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 as we rolled out the ALICE protocols three years ago, we worked with the students about not letting someone tailgate them. Uh, and we just recently had class meetings where the, the topic really was about course selection for next year, but it turned into a safety discussion with the students. And we asked for their feedback on areas that we can improve upon, but also some basic things like, if you see something, say something, but you're not, don't let someone come into the building that you don't know. And we really have made this area here the main entrance for students to come in. They're not supposed to come in, in the back, even though they'll complain that they're parking way in the back, they have to walk all the way around the building, but that's something that we've stressed with our students and staff, don't let people into the building unless they get buzzed in through the front. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's just, just letting it's some. Tailgating is a term. It's official. It's official. It's in our safety protocol guide now. And so, yes, and so if you do see us or we don't allow you in and be behind us, please don't take it the wrong way, but just buzz in and know that it's, it's protocol so that we can uh, follow our proper procedures. And I think sometimes what, what it's difficult is that the students in Hoppington are, are just genuinely so nice and kind and caring and they, they typically just want to let people into the building. But that's going to be some work that we continue to need to do with them. It's just to work with them about not allowing people into the building. Of course. Yep. And then sometimes it's awkward for me if I sh probably should know who you are and I shut the door because I'm not quite sure. If, you know, so it, it, I think it's, it's something we all have to get comfortable with. Thank you so much. I, I feel fortified just looking at you sitting up there in that staunch line. Um, but I, I want to ask what we as parents can do to most effectively support your efforts because I'm sure you have thoughts about that and it, it might be what kinds of conversations we could be having with our kids or with each other. Um, so I'd just love to hear your thoughts about how we can help you. One thing that uh, someone in the community who's been a longtime mentor of mine, she ran into some challenges with her son, and she tells the story, I won't name her, but she tells the story in lots of open settings about getting a phone call from a parent who said, um, I'm really concerned about your son, I heard this about him, and said it in the, in the kindest way possible to deliver challenging and scary news. You know, I think he's engaging in this behavior, I really hope I'm wrong, but I felt like I needed to tell you in case it's not wrong. So I always kind of hold on to that, and um, I guess none of us would want to hear something scary or bad or concerning about our kids, but I think we really do have a duty to each other that, you know, if, if you're concerned about my kid or if I'm concerned about someone down the streets kid, for whatever the concern is, I'm worried about them, their appearance has changed, they seem isolated, they dropped out of their teams, they seem quiet at Girl Scouts. To say something to that parent, again, in the nicest way possible, not in a, in a judgmental way, but to say I'm concerned, I hope I'm wrong, I hope everything's fine, but I noticed this and I just wanted to support you and offer that if you need anything, I'm here. Because we really don't know. I think one of the things that's, I guess if there's a frustration as a social worker in town, is that um, here people are kind of reluctant to come forward when things are hard. Um, we do a lot of celebrating of successes, but folks can be pretty quiet about when they have challenges, whether it's you know mental health challenges, if there's an addiction situation, if someone's getting a divorce. So um, I would encourage people to, to try and move beyond um, feeling concerned about what people think in some ways, and to reach out to, for support when you feel like you need it, and also to help your neighbors. Um, it doesn't have to be a phone call to me, or to a teacher, or to someone else up here on this panel. It can be a parent reach out, reaching out to another parent, and in some ways taking a risk that they might not like what you have to say, or might be insulted. But again, in the nicest way, most respectful way possible, out of concern, 
to reach out. I think you can support us that way. Um, and sometimes people do call and say, you know, I, I don't necessarily want you to tell this family who called, but I'm worried about them. Can someone in this network address it? And there's almost always someone who can in a kind way. I would add to that too. Um, the, you know, a couple of times now you've heard to see something, say something, and I think, so at the middle school, we like to think that uh, we have a strong community, and I think that we do. Nonetheless, every once in a while, something will happen, and we'll hear about it from a parent, whereas we learned that like maybe 10 students knew about something. Um, so it's, it's those moments where what we're trying to do as a middle school and, and ask ourselves, what can we do, be doing better to make sure the kids are coming to us and sharing with some adult in the building, and that's some of the work that we're talking about for next year is, is improve, in trying to improve those uh, adult to student relationships so that every step, every student has one adult. But so I would say, you know, uh, just echoing um, what everybody's talking about, but that seeing something, saying something, we've gotta, we've gotta realize that we're a community and, and our weakest link um, can affect us all. I would just add, I guess, a couple of things too. In terms of a communication, um, just from our experience, the one, the one key thing, just please make sure you're working with my department or your, or your buildings that you have your, your students in, and make sure we have your most up-to-date telephone and email and communication bits on file so that we can contact you in case of emergency. And if you need help doing that, please contact my office and we'll definitely reach out to help you do that. Because a lot of, obviously, uh, communication comes electronically these days and it's important that we have the correct information on file. Uh, to second that, I know it's probably one of the hardest things you may face to do, but if there is a, an event and a, a crisis in the police, maybe we'll speak to this, um, your, a lot of times your first thing is to call the school or the building to get more information. And I would encourage you not to do that right away unless it's an absolute must. Or if you don't get the, the phone or someone on the phone right away to rush to the building uh, and be present there because that can prevent emergency response groups from doing their work or it can prevent us from being able to communicate effectively to deal with the situation. So just hold the best that you could and wait for communications from the schools and listen to instructions from the uh, public safety officials before you take those actions. And please, if I'm wrong with that, no, absolutely. Uh, that's something from experience we've learned in this town and we would, we would yeah. like to improve that. It'd be hard, you know, especially if there was a real event and not knowing, but you gotta, you gotta understand that you know, if we have a job to do, all of us in public safety, we gotta get there uh, safely so we can respond and uh, do what we have to do. And then, you know, work as hard as we can on that reunification. Uh, plan. Hi. I'm curious as to um, what type of emotional supports are put into place after these events occur because um, here across all the grades, K through 12, uh, different things. So I have two kids, one in second grade, one in pre K3. So usually, so take for instance what happens in the high school. It takes a while for the information to trickle down or perhaps maybe my group of friends might see it on social media. So it's kind of a two-part question, the communication piece. Sometimes why is it this, the decision made to hold off on just an all-school, all-town announcement? This is what's happening. And I'm asking you this because um, in my old town, it was really beneficial that all of us knew what was happening just as an alert. It didn't mean that, you know, just because it wasn't happening in our kids' particular school, we're all going to go running down there. It was just a way to prepare, just in case, um, just to be on alert if something were to trickle down to my kids' age school, just to know, okay, I better be prepared to leave work or to call a babysitter, or the opposite end, which I've had happen to me here, where I have older sitters. Um, and I can check in on them and actually, if I know their parent works far away or is out of town, say you're safe. I just want to, you know, I don't know what you're hearing, but I just want to let you know you're safe. So I'm curious, the first part of my question is um, the communication piece on why some things just tend to stay only in the school if it's happening at and then, you know, the rest of us sort of find out later on because our kids do find out and they do have questions. So it's sort of like, we just want to be prepared, I think, as a community, when these <coughs> things happen, to be able to have age-appropriate conversations across the board. <coughs> yeah, so, and then I can, I'll ask my other question after that. 
Yeah, I think that sometimes in terms of the communication, there's only so much we can communicate. Um, and, and I think it, and sometimes in these moments, let's just take the incident that we found forward on school grounds. Our first, um, you know, we brought the crisis response team, we brought the police in, and it was to communicate directly to the, the families and, and students of the high school community. And like Ashok talked about earlier in terms of our walkie-talkies having a principal channel, oftentimes we'll then communicate with each other. They'll get the message and try to do their best to send that information out. But oftentimes we are in the midst of it and we're worrying kind of about the, the, the group that we're our cohort, so to speak. But another example is we had the incident on February 27th where our girls basketball team was playing uh, Holliston. And uh, a student from Holliston High School, we did not know this, but brought a, a BB gun in, into the game. Um, and that was something that we, we thought maybe this is, you know, because a lot of students and parents from all different grades will come to the game, it's, it's important for everybody to know about this. Um, but you bring up a good point in terms of the communication across the board. Because of this campus, three of the buildings and soon to be four of the buildings are all pretty close to one another. So when you have an incident that could affect everybody, I think it's something that we need to consider about how we communicate that to, to all the parents. But I think going back to the previous question, that there needs to be a level of trust uh, that we have to have with each other, that we're doing the best that we can in these situations, and we would love to be able to give you all the information, but there's, there's, you know, there's, there's laws and there's, there's privacy and there's certain things that we can't divulge everything. So we do our best to, to let you know the information that you can, um, but please trust in us that we're doing the best that we can. But to your point, I think we could, we could do a potentially a better job of communicating across the board. Uh, I would also say that I think, um, you know, one of the advantages of being a relatively small district um, but with a uh, central office right here, is that we know on that principal's channel, Ashok is on that principal's channel, as is the police, fire, and central office. So even when we've had um, minor emergencies, you know, a, a student or a, a staff member in need of, of transport or something, we can get on that principal's channel and key personnel up on this stage all are in, have that information, and we can rely on central office even though they may not be dealing with the medical emergency in the same way that I am as the person calling 911, that my central office knows, and they're determining then what response to take as a central office. Yeah, I guess I would just echo that. Um, the information that goes out is based on what the event is. It's based on the students who are involved. And eventually, we give out as much information as is, you know, as we're able to under the law. Um, and, you know, I guess communication is one of those things that districts are always working on. But um, when you are in the midst of it, there, is some, there are some times when you can't just give out information. If we go back to the day with the bullet, our, our primary goal on that day was to just keep order in the high school. If you think about it, you know, there are 1,000, 1,100 kids in this building. As soon as one kid knows, because of social media, you have you know, 1,099 additional kids who know. And if we want to have an orderly and safe dismissal for those students on that day, we need to make sure that the only people who are understanding what's happening are the people who are dealing directly with the incident in the main office. And that really did involve many of the people that you see on this stage. Um, my other question was um, in terms of when these events happen, what types of emotional supports are put into the um, schools afterwards? So is there, you know, some sort of opportunity for children to be able to discuss how they felt about the event because these things are very traumatic regardless of, you know, if it's just simply finding a bullet or God forbid something else happening, right? You're still sort of processing a certain amount of trauma. It's the fear of, of dying. It's the fear of almost having something happen to you because they're old enough now where they've seen these things play out. So I'm curious as to what types of conversations, if any, take place and what those look like to help them sort of move through these moments. I would say that when we have five schools with different age groups, we really think, and I think you saw this in um, the response to some of these other things that are occurring in the news and how the different schools are handling it, we want to think developmentally about the age of the students in our buildings. And so I know that in, the various schools, we can talk with our counseling team and we rely on the adjustment counselors, the psychologists, the counselors we work with. We have regular communications with people like Denise and Phil Powers all of the time 
to get their advice as well as central office on what's appropriate um, conversations about how we're going to deal with it with the students um, at our grade level. I think when you're looking at Allen's building and my building, we have students who have cell phones and are on social media and parents share everything and we also have parents who have decided not to have that for sure for their students. And so we need to respect that as a school that having sharing at, as a whole class discussion is probably not going to be appropriate um, at the same level it might be at the high school. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, that's a very fair point. I think to give you some specific examples at the high school, we had uh, class meetings with the students to talk a little bit about what was going on. We also have an advisory program at the high school where uh, the Thursday after this event we, we, we sat down in our advisories, which is every staff member at the high school has an advisory and there's 12 kids per advisory and the group follows through from freshman year to senior year. So it's the same group of 12 students. And so uh, we had a faculty meeting in the midst of that where we gave the staff some talking points on how to address it with the students. Um, and then during our class meetings, we asked students for feedback on areas that we can try to improve upon. We've gotten a great amount of responses. Uh, we've also met with our student council and other kind of leadership groups of students that have given us some feedback on areas that we can um, just focus on when it comes to this. But we just gave them the opportunity to just be heard and acknowledge their anxieties and their fears and how upsetting themselves. And I think when you talk about school violence, the most important thing that I think we could do to combat that is creating a positive climate and culture. And I think people have talked about that. And putting a premium on relationship building and having a trusted adult in the building. And so that's the, the essence of what this advisory program is, to have a, an adult that you've been working with for four years where you can talk to if you have questions. It's not going to be graded. You're not going to be assessed on it. The, the topics can be, uh, they can range. And, and, and I think that that has been a very important process for us in terms of kind of debriefing. And um, it, it, it actually, the situation with the BB gun came to our attention five minutes before we met with the freshman class. And so we talked about that almost in real time about what was going on. So to us, it's just giving the students a voice and, and acknowledging, uh, but also working with the staff, equipping them with the tools to be able to have some of these conversations. We have six guidance counselors at the high school, three adjustment counselors, and a school psychologist. We work very closely with Denise. Um, and one of our programs that we started uh, a few years ago is called our START program. I know this doesn't necessarily answer your question, but it's right through those doors over there. And it works with students that are returning from extended absences uh, and oftentimes from mental illness. And so uh, we have seen our reduction of hospitalizations for students for mental illness uh, decrease dramatically. Uh, and almost 0% uh, of students who have got hospitalized have been re-hospitalized since we've implemented this, this program. So that's another effort that we are making to try to work with the students and hear from the students and, and support families and students when it comes to school safety and, and ensuring a, a nurturing environment at the high school. And I think there's also that need to find balance because grief or fear or anxiety is really different for every kid. And so when you provide opportunity for kids to reach out, sometimes that's more comfortable for kids than to give sort of that one size fits all. Uh, what we've looked at, you know, different kinds of research, sometimes they'll say that providing, you know, a whole junior class assembly won't actually sort of emotionally do for kids what that one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one kind of session will. So I think we look at all of that. And, uh, and just uh, the other thing to add to that too, so with the middle school, uh, I know the high school has it as well, we have an, uh, a student uh, advisor program, so we have Ignite, uh, high school has Ignite, and uh, although it's not, um, doesn't meet regularly at the middle school, um, part of the responsibility as an eighth grader, um, uh, working with a sixth grader and kind of developing those relationships to be able to have uh, some of those conversations um, and establish that relationship. So I just want to thank everybody on the panel and everybody who came here as well. And a lot of the conversation <clears throat> is about preparedness. If something happens or right before it happens, um, what the question I'd like to present is, how do we prevent things from actually happening way before that? And the chief had mentioned, I think you identified like what, 36 red flags. And um, I'm curious to see what type of flags those were and how the police department would have avoided that. Um, I think one of them would have been social media, because I know <clears throat> as part of the Virginia Tech um, shootings, the guy had posted himself with, you know, with guns. Same thing with Florida. He said he was, a, he was actually going to carry out the act. So I think, Social media is one of the things we, you know, could, there's some type of surveillance. I'm not sure that gets carried out. I know there's a privacy thing, but is this some type of social media surveillance that is carried out throughout, you know, on a daily basis where we can actually spot these incidents before they happen? Uh, 
uh, the uh, school does have some technology. I just want to touch base real quick as far as the red flags. What I was referring to is not us. Uh, down in Florida, they, they were alerted uh, to you know, several calls and incidents and things of that that obviously were not acted upon. But uh, yes, I mean, we, we look at every technology that we can. One of the great things that uh, we have here in Hopkinton because of the marathon is that we have a lot of partners that uh, a community our size normally would have. We work with the Mass State, uh, State Police and about 30 different other federal agencies for the marathon. While that's only once a year, we plan all year long, but we have the opportunity to share information and constantly get in threat uh, assessments. Um, they do a great job. The Fusion Center in Massachusetts, where they uh, monitor social media, the uh, media, exactly what you said, and they're looking for those key keywords, uh, uh, you know, guns, terrorism, things, things of that nature. So we're lucky to have uh, those resources and I'll, I'll let Evan address a little further as far as what the schools do. Yeah, so to, to piggyback what Chief Lee mentioned, we do um, each morning it, uh, we get an email about, uh, I think it's called a suspicious inquiry query, where if a student were to be plugging in something into their computer uh, with the, the keyword of gun or something to that effect, we get a report every morning that we look at to, to see if there's a student that we need to call down to and talk to about that. But I think it goes back to the relationships that I talked about. Um, it, 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 social media is an area that, particularly at the high school, we get quite a bit of our information if, if there are to be some concerns, and I think that students feel very comfortable. Um, so, uh, General Officer Powers is right over there. He, he's, uh, we can't ask for a better school resource officer, in my opinion. He, he knows the kids um, as well as anybody, and I think kids feel very, very comfortable going to him, saying, hey, I saw this online, can you look into it? And then we convene our team, our, our group of uh, uh, counselors and administrators, call the parents, talk to the students, and do whatever we can to get that student the support that they need. Um, so I think we have a very good group of, uh, across the board of all the different schools, but Phil being that important person that works with each one of the, the, the buildings, to be able to identify any concerns that might come to our attention. Uh, and then we go through the process of, maybe the student needs to get put through a risk assessment. Maybe we just need to call the parents in and let them know about the activity that's online. Whatever it might be, it can range anywhere in between. Uh, but we do act upon any type of tip or, or or concern that we get, uh, but again, a lot of it does come from social media. So going back to the question of what parents can do, I think it's important that you, as much as you can, be as active in their social media presence as, as, as you can, and encourage your child that if they do see something, because kids will say, you'd be, you'd be shocked at some of the things that they'll, they'll say to one another, um, to just remind them that if they, they see something that just doesn't feel right, make sure you, you, you talk to somebody, even if it might not be you, because it might be awkward to talk to their parent, but someone at the school that they feel comfortable with, and then we'll take it from there. I just wanted to add something at the grassroots level. As an example of how committed we all are, we try to work together and collaborate to every extent. One of the things we have is called the Jail Diversion Program that we have licensed clinicians that come out with the officers in the field and the intent of it is to, to when someone is in crisis, instead of the traditional arrest and bail and release, we get them the, the, uh, the resources they need and get them in touch with someone and we avoid the arrest, which did no good, and we stop them through the process. But that partnership and that relationship continues through with Dr. Hildreth and um, with the school counselors and it's created a network over the years. And I just wanted to mention it because it's kind of cutting edge, it's forefront. These folks have been advocating for the funding and support and you folks have agreed to it. So there's been a lot of work bringing these programs online, seeking funding. You know, every department has competing budgeting uh, constraints, but that's just one example of how we all look at it as how we can work together to face all these issues, whether it's a mental health issue or the physical safety issue or mitigating or responding. But that jail diversion program and the mental health in this community is, is so far advanced than most. And even building up to that, while well, children at my level don't have social media, and thank oh, goodness they never get there, um, but we work on just good, respectful behavior, kind, unkind, inappropriate, appropriate, um, uh, dangerous, threatening. Kids these days cannot make comments um, as, as we might have when we were playing. 
Um, you cannot tell someone you're going to kill them, you're going to hurt them. All these things that children might hear in the news, on TV, even around a house if it's an adult conversation. So we're working on the teaching and developing an understanding, not just a consequence, but why that's not okay. Feelings, sharing, and also that speaking up. Um, for children to share that someone has, has said something unkind, um, when it's been happening again and again, that's a problem for us because we don't want it to happen again and again. So we work on addressing that behavior through our health, health classes, our morning meetings in classes. We have a terrific guidance counselor, social, um, psychologist, Denise has worked with us. So we're working on laying that groundwork. And something I can say that's very difficult in this world today is so many things in social media are easy for children to put out because there's no repercussions. We're working on teaching children to read emotions and body languages of others so that that child doesn't really want to play with you today. And that's OK. Um, but it's, as children get older, they can just put things out and they're not getting that feedback. So we're trying to work on developing the feelings, the empathy, and just that good kindness and care for others, even at the um, preschool level, we begin that way. I just wanted to add something, too. Um, sorry for uh, uh, giving a lot of answers to, um, to a single question. But I think, um, you know, I, I've been in several different districts. And, and more in this district than any district I've been in, there's a lot of collaboration, uh, a ton of collaboration. And so um, at the school level, um, if, if a concern comes up about a student, um, we have a group that meets uh, on a weekly basis. Um, it's our behavior support team and we talk about um, what we're seeing. Are we seeing patterns uh, with this child? What, what's happening with the child? How can we get him or her resources? And, and at times, it gets to the point where we say, okay, we need to involve somebody. And so, um, you know, uh, Phil Powers is our school resource officer. Uh, the, the resource is really important that he's been, he is a tremendous resource. And, uh, and then that's when we engage with the police department if, if need be. Uh, there's countless examples of us working collaboratively um, with that, and, and I don't yet know exactly like some of the details of Clapham Parkland, but um, I, I think that that collaboration uh, in this town is, is a tremendous asset. I have a question for the elementary school principals, specifically um, Elmwood, because that's where my daughter goes. Um, I know that you practice the fire drills, but do you practice the other kinds of drills like shelter in place or evacuation? And how is that handled? And, and if you do those drills, how often do you do them? So we don't, shelter in place um, and lockdowns aren't something that we practice all the time, but a couple, but, but we will. Um, and, and actually we have, Elmwood has a crisis team meeting tomorrow with our crisis response team to plan the next few drills that we're gonna have. And so on our list is a lockdown. We, we do have to be mindful. We have preschool in our building and we, we do think developmentally about what's the most appropriate because although we know the kids are aware of, of these situations in their world, we also wanna be careful about how we um, present those drills so that kids feel prepared but not frightened. Um, and so that's something that we'll be planning to, on our meeting tomorrow. But the other things that we've done is whole school evacuation drills. We've practiced those from the gymnasium. You know, I, for some of you may know that we have Kenya Day at Elmwood School. And so that's a really big event that involves lots of outsiders. And so we have to take some safety precautions at our school that other little elementary schools may not need to do. Um, and so we've instituted a whole school evacuation from the gymnasium. Uh, we've talked about, we, we have re reunification sites, and we've talked about even ju maybe just with staff, not with students, taking a hike to our reunification place so that folks know how to get there. If they're, they should go in a classroom by themselves or a whole school should take a walk. So those are things that we do regularly. Um, we talk in the cafeteria, I, I, I don't know, I would say quarterly, um, about what would you do if there was a fire drill right now. Uh, we typically tell kids at our age level that they would respond to an event as if it's a fire drill. We don't give them lots of additional information because at our grade level, the expectation is just that kids will do what the teacher tells them to do. They don't need a whole lot of additional information. As kids get older, they're expected to respond to cr crisis on their own. But at our grade level, a teacher is still guiding um, any kind of evacuation or drill. So. We spend a lot of time talking to kids about if something happens that's unexpected, 
you look to the grown-up that's in charge, whether that's your classroom teacher or a paraprofessional or the principal, and, and you follow the directions of, you know, stop what you're doing and follow the directions of an adult. And then the adults have the specifics of, of what they will do. Does that answer your question? And, and I can speak to center. Um, over the years, we've had a lot of experience with unexpected evacuations due to various building problems. So our staff is, is quite um, adept at that in terms of where we need to go, what the challenge is. And the key is making sure staff have that mental memory of what is it they should do. There are times that we coordinate with the fire department when we have drills. And intentionally, I will choose a transition. I will choose a time when half a grade is out of recess or when I know something is going on and it's going to be a little different, you're not all leaving right from your classroom. There are times the fire department in coordination with us will block off certain exits or we'll do an attendance count and we will intentionally talk to children prior. We will pull them from the lines to make sure they're accounted for. So things that we work on is really training our staff at these younger levels so that they are prepared to follow and direct um, the students in an emergency. There are times I've told parents when they're volunteering, don't hold the door, you need to leave. Um, so it goes along with the tailgating, it might seem unfriendly, but you're not going to be there in an emergency to hold the door. Um, so you need to evacuate with the rest of us and, you know, um, j just be on your way as you would. It's okay not to take care of the kids because we're, we're all taking care of each other um, with that. So I think the key is staff preparation and training. We revisit and go over various drills. Um, and again, we have our crisis meeting coming up soon and we'll be planning some <coughs> drills. We plan weather drills where the fire department has identified key areas of the building where, gosh forbid, we have a, a significant weather event, where are the safe spots in the building that you can all hunker down. Um, so that's a little unusual for kids to all be sandwiched in, you know, in, in a particular hallway or whatnot, but yet those are things we practice and we try to present it in a way so that we're prepared and as Ann said, um, prepared but not fearful of, of such events. Um, and I think if they can see the calmness of the adults around them because they are familiar, they're comfortable with these plans, we've discussed them, that carries over to how they'll um, function in such an emergency. Hi, thanks. Uh, we'll reiterate the, uh, the, and echo the sentiment of others in the room for taking the time to do this tonight. And I feel like I almost want to apologize for a little bit of a light attendance by, by the public. I think it should have been uh, more broadly supported, frankly. Um, you mentioned, um, you, I think you did a good job articulating the, the, the security in the four walls of, of, of each school. But I'm curious, you made a comment around the loop road <clears throat> and around the cameras, and I think there was some discussion at town at one point about the funding for the for cameras on the loop road and where we are as a, as a parent of a 16-year-old of a daughter who thinks she's gonna be driving at some point. Um, uh, you know, I do have some concerns about those the far parking lots, I think, was, it was brought up earlier. Um, it just, that seems to be such an obvious place for for bad behavior. And we, we, we all know about the, some, the vandalism that's happened with some cars on, on the loop road. Um, and, and frankly, some, some people don't feel safe walking during the day um, there. Well, what's the plan and what do you need from the town to kind of get that up on the kind of uh, priority list? Uh, I can speak a little bit about the budgeting and, and the, the plan for uh, the, the, the amount of cameras that are left. So I think the, the first priority initially was um, to finish off the other building. So there's still additional cameras needed um, here at the high school and middle school, Hopkins and Elm. On top of that, you know, after recent incidents, you know, with some issues with the parking lots and trash and grabs and some other things that have gone on around the campus, that was elevated by the police and by Phil to kind of take a closer look at putting um, cameras along the loop road, primarily in the parking lot areas, uh, around the doghouse area where there's also fence and I believe some break-ins, and around the track. So we kind of upped that on the priority list just this year. Um, and the, the first phase was really to focus on a system A that works because there's no primary internet connection down the loop road. So there's no fiber, no network down there. So this year, this summer, there's money in a capital article to put up an initial uh, three to five cameras on the loop road, primarily doghouse to track and some parking lots to kind of uh, practice and test the system, which would be wireless uh, and Wi-Fi based. To make sure that was effective in a small pilot before we went full scale. So plan A this summer would be to put those cameras in some key spots and to help put internal cameras uh, in the other buildings. So 
So that would be plan A. Um, currently, we, we're looking, we originally put in uh, the budget for around $200,000 to do some of that work. We've since reduced that by half, so we're working with half the amount of money. Uh, if that passes, that would, that would go forward and try to do some of that work. So the funding, the funding has been there. We've been trying to break it <coughs> over chunks over years to make it affordable. Uh, but that would be the end goal, is to have that kind of cover the loop road, the fields, and then the rest of the buildings. Um, sorry, just a couple of questions. Um, the first person that just talked, you uh, mentioned uh, when the doors are ajar, there was an email notification that went out. And I don't know if that was accurate. It just seemed like email was very slow way to get a notification, so just comment on that. Um, and then the audit that was done four years ago, is there plans to do another audit? I mean, four years, a lot has changed in technology and school safety and every incident you learn more and more from. Um, another point was just the, the double entry. Um, it's great to have double entry, but it's just glass. Is it just glass or is there, is it bulletproof glass? Um, and then just the school resource officer, I just didn't really understand. Is it just this one school resource officer at the high school or does all the schools have it? I rotate walls, but maybe the high school. At Marathon, we do have some bullet resistant glass. They won't call it bulletproof, but we're not going to tell you probably all exactly where it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just to touch base on the uh, school resource officer. Uh, I did put a, an extra position in the budget this year that would uh, supplement our police department and supplement uh, Phil's position. Uh, the plan would be to get two new officers trained as, as uh, SROs, uh, and they would do it on a part-time basis. And Phil could concentrate on the high school where they could handle the, uh, the other two schools. So we're working on that uh, to address it. I, could, I mean, I just to address the uh, notification system. That's correct. I had mentioned that um, there's a there's security group that's created to um, basically notify key personnel if, if if there is a door that's that's been held open. So that that's currently in place. Uh, as of right now, the plan is just to get through the first audit and the details of the plan first before we reassess. But obviously, part of our cycle would be to reflect and once all those things are in place, we take a look at what we have in place and look at what the new strategic plan would be after that and then we will develop a new plan and move forward with that plan. So uh, the goal for now is we're, we probably have, a, in my opinion, at least two to three years to finish out that plan financially before we look at a new one. Thank you. Do you have someone designated to monitor these cameras all day long? Or are they just, you know, monitor when the kids are coming in at noontime? How, how does that work? Yeah, so at the high school, at least, there is a, a number of personnel, administration, and a few others that have access to them. Um, I can't say that we're monitoring them uh, all the time during the day. Oftentimes, we pull them up if there's an issue. Um, we. Uh, I don't know what it's like in other buildings in regards to that, that, that process, but we've been trying to, um, it, it's an app that we have on our laptops that can always be up on our screen if we need it to be, and often our assistant principals are, are, are checking in with it, um, but we don't have a designated person that, that monitors it at all times to answer your question. Uh, I think we do a pretty good job of doing our best to monitor it as much as possible. Um, that, and I feel like in terms of just being visible, we, you mentioned earlier about people coming into the building. Uh, if they had a weapon at the beginning of the day, uh, we do our best to position administrators at each one of the entranceways uh, each morning. Uh, Officer Phil is always out here in the morning, and our assistant principals are always in the back of the building just to be a visible presence for kids as well. But um, it, the, the, the cameras uh, have helped in a lot of ways in, in regards to um, safety, in our opinions. Uh, it's also kind of reduced some of the, the, the theft that we have, have seen still that exists a little bit, so there's been some other benefits of the cameras. Um, and um, to kind of go back to the question over here about how many drills. At the high school we have four fire drills, but we also have two to three kind of ALICE drills, we call them. In our next drill, we are uh, hoping to do kind of a, a process where there might be an active shooter. We'll tell the kids, we'll let the, the families know that it's just a drill. They maybe have officer power, powers be that person that kind of moves throughout the building. And the administrators would then be looking at the camera and try to make announcements to the students in real time, looking at the cameras. We haven't done that as a drill yet. So that's going to be something that we're going to um, 
to try. We also have uh, a laptop. In, there's, a, there's, a, there's a room in the office. We call it a safe room. It's in the back. It used to be kind of a storage room where we have a, a phone and a computer that has access, that has all of the, the, the images up that we can take a look at and a paging opportunity with the phone in there. So there's been some links that we have taken to be able to, if there was an emergency, to go into that room and kind of make real-time um, announcements. Yeah, and not, and not to be rude, also, we, we would also prefer not to go into every single detail of, you know, I, we want to be as transparent as possible, but we also don't want to lay out the, the entire uh, security layout for people. Right. You're right, it's a very valid point, and I guess I would just feel comfortable. I wasn't trying to get your secrets. I'd rather be out on the floor, walking around, than sitting there watching a camera all day, you know. I think I, my duties would be better off out about. Okay, if we don't have any further questions, I do want to thank you all once again for coming out tonight. I mean, clearly it's wonderful to have people who are so concerned about our children and our public safety that you're willing to give up time know on on a weeknight when you know we know you have families at home so we are very grateful to have you here and again I hope that you know as you're leaving you'll think about some of those see something say something working very closely with your own children putting trust in the people who you see in front of you um, and you know just know that that we are all in in this with the with the same intent and keeping our kids and our families and you know our, our public ways safe so thank you again for coming out tonight